Good evening, gearheads. Welcome to your Sunday night with Speed City. Wrapping through all the motorsports that happened during the past week, this is John Massengill. I am in the studio in Austin, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Jonathan Green. How are you, Mr. Green? Very well, thank you, sir. How are you? I am doing good in kind of a cool, rainy Austin weekend uh, to start off the spring break. Not not exactly exciting. I say to start off to really wrap up spring break here. Yeah, I saw the rain coming down. My plants need it. That's all good. Well, it uh, it is. Uh, we've had a lot of of uh, things to do this week because we had uh, we got to interview an ex F one driver. Daniel Kvyat is uh, going to be with us here. We did an interview with him, recorded it yesterday, and so we'll have that interview. We're going to talk all about the twelve hours of Sebring. That was a another fantastic endurance race here in America. Really, really exciting race to watch. We'll talk about that. And we're going to get into lots of Formula One stories tonight because there's the continuing saga at Red Bull and really kind of some of the dominoes that haven't been talked about a whole lot that you're going to talk about, Jonathan. And we'll get into all of that stuff. We'll talk a little NASCAR because we got that here in Austin in a week and MotoGP right on its tail about less than a month away right after that. So we got lots to talk about, Greeny. Yeah, and you know what? Before we get into it, I just want to kind of, you know, you mentioned Kvyat, you mentioned NASCAR. I, you know, I do Trans Am, and, you know, we, we keep talking about, you know, the, the technology of, of, of motor racing and, you know, the sound of Formula One is not like it should be and how we don't like Formula E. And it was interesting. There was a comment by Kobayashi uh, this week saying that NASCAR would be a huge hit in Japan because <laughs> of the noise. And, you know, I just love the fact that NASCAR has got an ex-Formula One world champion in Jensen Button, has got a guy with over 100 Grand Prix from Russia, of all places, in NASCAR next weekend at Coda. <laughs> and you've got one of the greatest drivers in my mind, um, or what I would call the most, a, a decathlete of, of racing drivers, in Shane Van Gisbergen. There is no, there is no motorsport he can't do. And he, too, has chosen NASCAR. So, you know, for all the advances in technology and the future of motorsport, the old, good old stock car, loud, noisy, fun NASCAR that is America is still and continues to be popular massively. <laughs> and and uh, and getting more diverse every week. <laughs> yeah. It's, no, it's, it's fantastic. And we got it coming here to Coda in a week. And that's... That's an exciting weekend out there. And it does really good too, doesn't it? We get a lot of folks out there. Yeah. And, you know, we've always sort of joked, you know, how could Formula One take off in Austin with no motorsport heritage? How could NASCAR attract it in the middle of Texas, even though, you know, we kind of consider ourselves part of the South? It's, it certainly ain't North Carolina and Alabama and places where NASCAR is absolutely king. Um, and yet it has taken a hold on, um, you know, on Texas and it's getting more and more popular every year. Yeah. And particularly Austin, right? Austin is its own version of Texas and having NASCAR here. It, it's really it's it's fantastic. And it's very interesting to to see how it, it plays with Austin. But, man, it works. Big crowds out there every year. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and I also like to see the NASCAR drivers stretched because of road racing. Um, you know, it, it, unless you've done simulation or unless you've actually sat some time really studying NASCAR's oval racing, it can seem to the outside viewer as pretty boring um, because you can't see the action happening as well as you can perhaps in, in a Formula One or in a touring car or in an IMSA car. Whereas once you get them on a road surface, you see what these guys like Carl Larson can really do and their car control, and also how unwieldy these cars are uh, on what is a very precise, precision-based track like Coda. Well, I, uh, I'm i looking forward to it. Let's, let's see how this thing goes again this year. It's been a great success. So, But let's move on to Sebring, Mr. Green, because an iconic endurance race every year, the 72nd running of Sebring. I mean, going back to 1952, that that's a, you know, that's not a hundred years of, 
of the Indy 500. But, I mean, 72 years of the same endurance race in Sebring, that's a pretty cool deal. March 15th, by the way, was the first race, 1952. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, very cool. And, you know, uh, it, it, ironically, as you know, Silverstone, the first home of the Formula One Grand Prix, uh, was held at an ex Formula, uh, excuse me, an ex World War II airport. Um, and pretty much Sebring was the same two years after. Yeah. Uh, and yet, while, while all of those tracks and the airfields were converted into racetracks back in the 50s, many of them, uh, Sebring being one, uh, but they refused to change the service of Sebring. It would ruin the nostalgia. So the bumps remain. And God knows, I've just, I was there a few weeks ago doing Trans Am, and we don't have great suspension. But, you know, these race cars, as you well know, aren't, aren't designed. They're designed to stick to the floor and go as fast as they can. So your teeth don't come into it. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know how you could sit in one of those cars for 12 hours and rattle your teeth the way they do. Uh, I know. It was fun watching those super flat cars, right? Hit, running over all those bumps, pretty crazy. But uh, it was a great race, Jonathan. I don't know. I know you said you didn't get to watch much of it. I had it on all day yesterday. I was doing it. Actually, I was working on my car and doing lots of stuff, but I had it on going pretty much start to finish. And it was, at the end, fantastic racing, especially. Louis Delatraz, a late race pass on Bourdais to claim victory for the WTR Andretti team in an Acura and that was pretty cool. But the whole race, it was like, it was the perfect Sebring, right? It, right? it was really warm, almost hot, a little bit of, you know, always a, ch a threat of rain out there. Fantastic racing up and down all the different classes. And, you know, it gets better every year and a higher level every year. The technology goes up and, and I love it, right? They, as the sun sets, squinting through a dirty windshield into the sinking sun and then two hours of racing in the dark. There's just something special about endurance racing, isn't it? So, so was Toto Wolf and Zach Brown there? I mean, how did Mercedes go? I mean, was it? Oh, Andretti and Cadillac. They're not good enough to go international motor racing, are they? No, but I have wondered about that. I put that in my notes thinking, <laughs> huh, okay, FOM, are you paying attention? And another victory for Andretti, teaming up with Wayne Taylor the Racing. first, actually, with yeah. Acura. Yeah, yeah, with Acura. But the Cadillacs, of course, have just been dominating for several years in the, in the upper class. And look, we've got we've got uh, these new hybrid cars in the GTP class in Sebring. I mean, this is a pretty sophisticated series. And I talked with Jeremy Shaw, who did um, all the uh, the commentary for the uh, the European side of the broadcast. Right, I, I spoke with him this afternoon for probably thirty minutes or so. And he was, he said, you know, the feeling there, he said there was a huge crowd. He said the feeling that, he said it feels like that IMSA is the place to be right now. He said, because obviously we've got fantastic racing, right? <laughs> you don't know who's going to win the race for sure. And any class for that matter. And you've got so much going on. I mean, we had that huge crash, right? There was a Pippo Durrani. Um, in the 57 Cadillac, he was leading the race at the time and it was a huge crash, turned the thing upside down. I don't know. It looked really scary at, there was a long time waiting for, to see if he was okay, but he turned out fine. And I don't know how long he was upside down, Jonathan, but it, it looked pretty crazy, but he stepped out of the car and he gave a wave to the crowd and everything. But I mean, the race, this 12 hour race had, had a little bit of everything for everybody. I'm looking at the crash now. Yeah, Pippo, of course, uh, well, I, I'd say a good friend, but I knew him when. Uh, just like <laughs> just like all of these youngsters, uh, the Toyota Racing Series was where I met him uh, when he was a kid. Uh, and his progression has been awesome. He's been on the show a few times. Uh, but we love Pippo Durrani, one, one, a, special, a special guy. Mm. All right, and early in the race, actually, I know exactly how early because my son's team in the uh, number 70 McLaren. He's a mechanic for them. He... Uh, he got it. He got tied up in this, and there was this crazy spin by the Ferrari, the number sixty-two. It spun all the. It spun off to the right, and then spun back straight through the crowd, and without hitting a single car, ended up on the other side of the track. I mean, I was watching it in slow motion, going, "How did he miss?" You know, the, remember the video game Frogger? How you go across the road directly yeah. perpendicular? Somehow the Ferrari went through that. 
and did not hit a single car, although the two McLarens, the only two McLarens in the entire field, somehow came together and uh, ruined it for the number nine. And the number 70 actually came back and, and finished uh, seventh overall, actually. They did great. and uh, But that was a crazy, crazy moment in the race. But really, the end of the race, the last, I got worried because there was a lot of full-course yellows. But towards the end of the race, we, we got the last clean 10 minutes. And the battle between Delatraz and Bourdais, it was, it was fantastic. I mean, battling wheel-to-wheel down the straight. And then in the corners, there was contact in almost every corner, dodging GT cars the whole way through. And Delatraz coming out on top of that. It was really, it was a great, it was a great finish to that race. Yeah, I love Sebring. Daytona and Sebring are a great way to start the international scene in America, uh, by tradition, if you will. I mean, I know there's a lot more competing for it now with Formula E starting so early and Formula One starting even earlier now, th- this these years. But it used to be Daytona and Sebring were kind of like the, the, the big highlights of the early part of the international calendar. Well, I mean, yeah, it still feels like it here. So, I mean, and of course, there was the usual cavalcade of stars. I mean, you had... You know, Indy cars drivers. I mean, you had what Grosjean and Kirkwood and um, uh, Dixon, H- and Hinch- Hartley, Ditchcliffe, and, H- and Hinch- uh, James Hinchcliffe was was driving there. I mean, it was on and on and on. It was as usual a a fantastic group of drivers. So it was really awesome. But I'm just looking at the clock, Jonathan. Let's get in our first break, and when we come back, we're going to pivot to Formula One, because we have lots to talk about in Formula One. Stick with us through the break. You're listening to Sunday Night with Speed City. All right, we're still live on YouTube. Oh, got lots of comments going on. We got David Lawrence. We got Kevin Kelly, Mike Bowles, Ray from Charlotte. Uh, We got the usual. What are you talking about here, guys? Uh, you guys talking NASCAR with Coda, David says. It's quite refreshing. Yeah, we just don't get a lot of NASCAR talk in. But, man, when it comes to our city, we got to talk about it. It's going to be hard, though, Jonathan. You're going to be gone, unfortunately, but we're going to be doing the uh, Australia middle-of-the-night broadcast. Go home and get some sleep and then go out to the track for for the NASCAR race. That'll be It'll be fun, though. What else? Kevin Kelly said yeah, Sebr- Sebring wore me out. He was Kevin and I were going back and forth a little bit. And he was, said it was uh, he was watching every bit of it. Yeah, David Lawrence, I love it. Sebring delivers again. What a classic! It really was. It felt like it just again. Uh, David Lawrence says, "Hey, uh, hey, John, Jeremy does IMSA radio with uh, John Hundell. Listen to them all day." Yep, I was listening, David. That's why. I, that's how I watched it, or mostly listened. Hi, this is Max Steppen, and you're listening to Speed City. Welcome back to the fastest hour in radio, Speed City. All right, welcome back to Speed City. I said when we came back, we talk a little Formula One. And I guess we have to start with the exhausting Red Bull stories. Um, Jonathan, the latest, of course. You know, we <laughs> It's been the never-ending soap opera, right? Yeah, you say exhausting, and I agree. It's 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 gone on way too long, but... To be honest, it's becoming it, – it's like a snowball. It, it is gathering. It yeah. is gathering. Um, and it could turn out to be one of the biggest sto- uh, stories in a decade uh, simply because um, – it, 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 I mean, this started off as a disgruntled um, employee, if I read this right, um, taking unacceptable behavior from a team principal, right? Yeah. And that on its, uh, you know, I mean, come on, we're all big boys and big girls. Uh, we've we've seen this in the corporate world. It happens in tech industry. It happens in any industry. And it's life. People flirt. People say inappropriate things or put pressure in inappropriate ways um, in a corporate situation. Right. No, it's not acceptable. And the way that this has been dealt with both internally and externally has been appropriate. But. We are now looking at a one disgruntled female employee who now, of course, is appealing the results, the results, uh, sorry, the 
resolved issue as it was put to bed before the start of the season, it has now blown up into a situation now where the FIA are involved, Red Bull Austria are involved, and the entire 23-year history of Red Bull could collapse overnight with a three-time world champion leaving the team, which has been the most successful team in the last, well, potentially in the history yeah. of Formula One. Yeah, look at the look at the records that have fallen with under Max Verstappen and Red Bull. It's crazy. And you know, I said this right from the get go. I, I, I used the word hit job, but what I meant by that was this wasn't about the girl. That she's the catalyst, and it needs to be rectified, and she needs to be heard. And it needs to be sorted. And if that mm -hmm. means firing Stu Horner, so be it. Uh, not that I want that, but I don't know the ins and outs. Nobody does. But we've certainly got an idea for what has gone on because this did not start with the media as it often does in Formula One. This started with Red Bull. And that's where I said hit job, which was clearly the power struggle that we're now seeing between Verstappen, Helmut Marko, the Thai owner, the new head of Austria um, that replaced Massachusetts, and of course, um, Christian Horner himself, are in a power struggle for effectively running the team. And the latest is, and like I said, the FIA are also now involved because he is one of the team principals of their sport. Um, but what's interesting is Max quite vociferously came out last week and said, having won the race, um, because they were talking about how Marco potentially being under investigation himself for leaking material to the mm. press, mm. saying that he could be reprimanded or at least asked not to go to Australia while they investigate him. And Max Verstappen came out and said, if he goes, I potentially go. And that has now put us into two corners of the heavyweight boxing ring that is Red Bull Racing <laughs> with Horner in one corner and Helmut Marko and our triple world champion and his father in the other. <laughs> yeah, uh, this this is, like you said, snowballing because let's talk about what could happen if all this happens. Where are all these people could end up, including Max, including Adrian Newey and Horner and everybody else? Yeah, and, you know... We talked about the dull season of Formula One where Red Bull won 23 of the 24 races. Oh, my God, they've won the first two. They're going to do it again. It's going to be a boring season. Ha! <laughs> Shakespeare would love this script. <laughs> this is fantastic. I mean, they, I mean, they could go on and win 24 races, but that's not what we're going to be talking about <laughs> because by the end of it all, and I do think that all of the ramifications that we're looking at now will kind of have a knock-on effect to next year, we could be looking at a scenario where Horner stays and Max and Marco go. Where they go, we'll talk about in a moment. Or we could be looking at a situation where Horner is fired because of this behavior and suddenly we have a, you know, uh, a gap at the top of Red Bull which, let's be honest, whether you like it or don't like Christian Horner, the guy has been the guy that took over from Jaguar and has steered this team to the success it's had with Vettel and with Verstappen and in the constructors with Weber and many other drivers, Kvyat included, um, to where we are now. And so it, it is, like I said, it's a tectonic plate movement of Formula One, and it could lead, as I mentioned there, to a... House of Cars that that well the series House of Cars would be proud of. You, I mean, <laughs> you, I mean Netflix couldn't write a script better. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> but what do you think? Well, let's not let's not speculate on what you think could happen. Let's speculate on what could happen, Jonathan. I mean, what happens if if this really comes to be? I mean, it's hard to even imagine Max leaving. But he's remember last year, even before the beginning of the year. If I'm not mistaken, he had, you know, he was grumblings about possibly retiring then, way back then. Yeah, and we've always known that Helmut Marco, uh, who is kind of the driver's eye, uh, the ex Formula One driver, with a view to nurturing the 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 young drivers, uh, Max included. So there is a lot of um, feeling, uh, you know, patronage, if you will. He's a father figure 
to these young drivers. Uh, and the latest, the next one is Lawson. Um, but he's also on the on the back end of it. Also, the guy that would fire an Alban, fire a Ricardo, fire um, a Kvyat if they weren't performing, and currently will fire uh, Perez potentially. Uh, but he's the mover and shaker when it comes to the drivers. Um, and I think moves like bringing Ricardo back, uh, as Horner did, um, were not popular with Marco, and he has said as much. So, um, yeah, before we go on to talking about who's going where and, and that potentiality, I think it's a side of, of all of this that, that makes things so interesting um, for the future of so many drivers involved, potentially, in this mess, frankly. Mm. Uh, I'm watching YouTube. Yeri is saying Max is going nowhere. There is no power struggle. The CEO of a Red Bull GM, GmbH decides Horner is appointed People forget that Red Bull Racing is not a team, but a Red Bull number one marketing tool that sells their cans. Yes, all of that is true about about the marketing and how they work. But I'm not as convinced as Yuri is that Max is going to go nowhere. What do you think, Greeny? I I was amazed, and I think I used the word petulant when he came out and said, "Well, if Marco goes, I go," because it just seemed that a 26 year old with the world at his feet, earning millions of dollars to be the best driver in the world. And the truth is the best driver in the world is only defined by the fact that he has the best equipment. It's like it's like the astronauts that don't get to go on the spacecraft. They're not lesser astronauts. They just don't get a ride on the rocket. And, yeah. and you know, I think that's the, the, the case. And as even Toto Wall said, um, you know, yeah, we'd love to have Max Verstappen at Mercedes, but he'll only drive in the best car. So for Max to put that comment out about Marco, who, let's face it, is 80 something, um, he's not going to be around forever, way before Max's career is at, at an end. So unless uh, Max Verstappen has another agenda, which could involve the um, the change from Honda to Ford, which will be a huge change, and also the rule changes in 2026. He might just be hedging his bets a little bit. And I believe if we read between the lines, he has a clause in his contract that if Marco does go, he potentially can go. And that also, interestingly enough, goes for the other superstar multiple world championship winning guy in that team. And that, of course, not is Christian Horner, is Adrian Newey. He's mm -hmm. got more championships than anybody in Formula One. Okay, so it are you? Is it feel like this is an either or uh, that either Horner goes or Helmut Marco goes, or do you think that if um, if Horner were to stay, for example, would Helmut Marco go? I mean, does it have to be? Do you feel like it's come to that point? I I, I think re reading between the lines of everything I've I've read, yes. I believe that the power struggle is really between um, the Thai owners, the Austria owners, the team principal and Helmut Marko, um, who is the driver, coach, stroke, advisor to Red Bull uh, Austria. And I believe that it's not an either or, but I think it's come down now to either Horner goes or there's going to be some changes. And, and I think... Um, also, you could include in this the Hamilton move to Ferrari has also sparked a lot of interest in those tectonic plates with everybody wants it, want, wanting to, you know, to, to, ch to change dance partners, you know, and maybe <laughs> maybe maybe we'll see that come into play as well. But that was the first sort of shake was Hamilton. And then this story has suddenly grown bigger with everybody thinking uh, I don't think Max started this season or started the preseason before any of this blew up, thinking he was going to leave Red Bull. But now uh, Hamilton has set things in motion. Um, you know, um, I, I do think that opportunity, and that is what, you know, Formula One drivers are always looking for, um, could mean that he he's, he suddenly started to look at this. And I, I've, I've the only other person I haven't mentioned is Jos Verstappen, and I think he's the puppeteer in a lot of this. To be honest, mm -hmm. I, I, I think uh, what he said in the press and his comments about knowing the girl in question and seeing the text come through when he was with her um, also add fuel to the fire. 
I don't think Jos and uh, Horner necessarily see eye to eye. And if you really look into the past of Jos, he's a very volatile figure. Um, was when he was a racing driver and is as both a father and effectively quasi-manager of his son. So it wouldn't surprise me if the guy rattling everybody's cage within the team is Jos, and he quite likes the idea of a power play between Marco and his son. His son's kind of dis- you know, distanced himself from his dad's opinions. But, you know, I know as a son, you know, you don't fall far from the tree. And if dad's saying one thing, you, you either got to come out and really disagree or just walk away from it. And he's done e- neither. Mm. Well, we don't know what's going to happen. I, I, I just wish it would resolve itself, honestly. I, I know that it's probably going to be a pretty dominant season from Red Bull, but I'm ready to talk about racing some more. And speaking of racing, what I know, can I, can I, before we finish this though, can I give you the permutations that, that have come to me while I've been doing my research Absolutely. on this? Okay. So what happens is Horner stays because the council Red Bull found him not guilty. Okay. She has uh, not accepted that uh, theory and is appealing. We'll see what happens in that appeal. The FIA are now looking into it as well. But let's just say Horner does stay and is vanquished of this problem. And he remains team principal. Well, Max follows through. Helmut Marco goes and effectively retires. And Max goes to a team that he believes might be the next great team. Whether it be uh, Mercedes, <laughs> as I've just mentioned. Lance Stroll has said he would be interested at any kind of cost to get Max Verstappen. Yeah, Lawrence, yeah. So Aston Martin could come into play. Yeah, he would write um, as big a check as it would take, right? Because that's not in the cost cap. No, it's not in the cost cap. Uh, and Adrian Newey, more interestingly to me, could potentially jump ships and go of one of two places, Mercedes or Ferrari, or if Stroll yeah. is as big as his boots say, to Aston Martin. Imagine Max and, when and those Newey. cards fall. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. So go ahead. When those cards fall, then who fills the Red Bull seat? Lawson's ready, uh, but he is predicted to take Perez's seat. Alonso could be ready, but would Honda accept him, even though they're on the, the way <laughs> out? Uh, Alonso is second in line if Verstappen or nobody bigger than him, uh, like an Alban, uh, takes the Mercedes drive. Um, if he goes with a Kimi Antonelli, which, of course, I'm talking about Toto Wolf now at Mercedes, um, who is in F2 and just 17, um, uh, then potentially um, Alonso could fill in that gap of two years because he can't get a super license because he's only 17. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it's wicked. And then you go down the line. Where does Ricardo come in? Where does Alban come in? Um, you know, already Gasly and... and um, Mm. Ocon are ready to jump ship because they've got no car to drive. Um, and <laughs> it's yeah, fun. It, it is insane. All right, well, let's get a quick break in. And we got Daniel Kvyat, the interview we did with him coming up quickly in this next segment. we got a couple more F1 things to talk about before we go to that. You're listening to Sunday Night with Speed City. Back after a quick break. All right, we're still live on YouTube. Uh, I read Jerry's post when we were on the radio. Um, Ali, Ally W says Max could end up without a seat. Ah, wow. And now very corporate world, what board would allow him and his team anywhere near their company? Man, we with these after these shenanigans, yeah, we've, I, I can't even imagine somehow Max not ending up in, in a seat. But. Um, that I don't believe. Yeah. Hey, so. Ali, mark this day. We all said you were wrong. <laughs> uh, let's yeah. see. Yeah. <laughs> Been wrong before. Yeah. Kevin Kelly says Horner's going to end up it. owning the team. <laughs> and that was part of the rumor, right? Of course, well, that Horner, that was part of the problem. They were saying that Horner was making moves to try to get shares and be like Toto. And so, which they said about Gunther Steiner, too. What else here? Gary says, Max has no problem with Horner, Max, and and Yoss. I said, we'll not go away after the scandal. But, you know, your point, Jonathan, is, is Horner has already been resolved of the uh, – absolved, I should say. All right, come back.
Hello to everyone. This is Gunter Steiner. This is Speed City. Welcome back to the fastest hour in radio, Speed City. All right, before we go to our interview with XF1 driver Daniel Kvyat, I want to talk just a little bit more about F1 because some of the notes, some of the stories that came out after Ali Behrman's just amazing debut, right? And I saw one from Jacques Clear, right, Jonathan, that he said, basically, uh, he said, I've never seen anything like that. He's a legendary engineer. He said, I've never seen anything better than that, talking about his debut. And I'd already marked up a story about every teenager in Formula One. And I thought, this is a great segue for you because you've seen most of these guys over the years, right? And 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 just yeah. go, th- go think about that. Do you think this is the you know the best debut? Hey, I mean it's up there. I mean, you know, I mean if I, if I really want to date myself, I, I was good friends with Chris Amon, who came in to Ferrari at nineteen and, and was a sensation straight away. Um, but the performance by Behrman, uh Behrman was 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 pretty exceptional, to be honest. I mean, you know, he was racing a different car earlier in the weekend and he'd already qualified that car on pole. This wasn't a call up. Um, I mean, this was, I mean, this was last minute.com on hydrogen. I mean, it was <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so the lack of preparation, I mean, Lawson was a, a huge story from last year. Yeah. Uh, and the, and the job he equipped himself with um, amazing, but yeah, I mean, so many, Teenagers, Kvyat included, funnily enough, um, when he came in to uh, replace Ricardo when yeah. he moved up to Red Bull. Ricardo moved to Red Bull. They had a hole at um, Toro Rosso. And Kvyat, who'd won Formula Renault and won um, the GP3 championship, was immediately moved in there as a young Russian at 19. And, of course, Russian money was swelling about then, back in the good old days when we all loved good old <laughs> Russia. And uh, I, don't, I don't remember those. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, there's some great stories of guys that were sort of overnight sensations and would bring a couple of million dollars. You know, Alex Young coming into Minardi. Um, you know, uh, Thackwell was in your list. I saw that. Um, but, yeah, um, I, I don't think anybody has made an impression in a top team like this since Chris Amon. And that was with Ferrari back in the day, back in the late fifties. Um, because he really not hasn't come out of nowhere, but it just shows you that the ladder to Formula One and what they're doing in Formula Two in terms of preparation and the cars that they're driving um, really do prepare these kids to jump in and be, and, and likewise, the well, Friday practices and the simulation work has put them in a situation where they can literally jump in and be aggressive, let alone take part. Okay. Well, I mean, he was overtaking people for money. Well, let's think about this, though. I agree. Yes, they're, they're probably more prepared than ever. But let's just lay out what he did, right? He, he didn't even get a full practice session before his qualifying, right? He comes in and qualifies yep. 11th almost a few hundredths of a second off of Lewis Hamilton. So he's starting 11th, but setting the stage before the race. Think about this. Think about the pressure cooker that he's, what he's doing. He's with Ferrari, right? Where the expectations are always as high as they can get, right? The, the, the team pressure is always crazy high. I know that Frederick Vassour is probably a little less uh, heavy handed in his style as the way it feels right now, but still this is Ferrari. And you are jumping in this car at this circuit with looming walls all around you and and the entire world watching and wishing for something to happen because we've got Max Verstappen dominating. And then to finish seventh where he finished. I mean, it was it was pretty close to a fairy tale story. I mean, the only way if he had hit if he had somehow finished on the podium or or with some fluke won the race is about the only thing better than what could have that what we saw happen. So, I mean, it was, it was pretty high up on all the boxes of, of things that you want to have as a rookie and have a really amazing story. Well, and it, it's accelerated just as it did with Lawson, his position within Ferrari and within that um, 
Ferrari family, which includes Haas. Uh, I read a story today that Frederick Vasseur has has literally said that Beerman is now their reserve driver and their number one reserve driver. He's going to do um, six Friday practices for the other Ferrari uh, powered team, which is Haas, and he may and he will do uh, some Ferrari uh, Fridays for the Ferrari team. Um, and that, to me, was a story that was kind of tucked away. And when I read it, uh, again, my Toyota background, I thought of Robert Schwartzman, who's been yeah. with the Ferrari Academy now for best part of five five years, four years, yeah. and was absolutely the number one reserve up until the the point that Beerman got in that car last week. <laughs> Yeah, it's really an amazing story. It's funny you mentioned Haas. What does he do now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you mentioned Haas, the other Ferrari team. Uh, if I were K-Mag or Hulkenberg, I'd be a little bit worried right. about, about where Behrman's going to end up. So, all right, Greeny, well, let's well, pivot again. I mean, every, every, all right, well, everything you read says that, that Behrman's getting, that, yeah. getting a drive in 2025 at Haas. Yeah. All right, well, let's pivot because I got to catch up with an ex-F1 driver, and not just any ex-F1 driver, a pretty experienced one. And I go all into all of his background at the start of this interview. So let's hear this interview we did with Daniel Kvyat. I am genuinely excited about our guest today. Daniel Kvyat is one of the best race drivers in the world. Like many, he started in karting and after stints in some lower Formula series, he made it to Formula One at only 19 years old. And on his F1 debut, became the youngest point scorer in Formula One at the time. His F1 career spanned over 100 starts in Formula One. And finishing as high as seventh in the Drivers' World Championship, his resume is one of the best on the planet. He's currently racing in the prestigious FIA Formula One, or excuse me, the FIA World Endurance Championship with the Lamborghini Iron Lynx team in the hypercar class. He did a handful of races in 2022, but is returning to NASCAR next weekend to compete in the Xfinity Series at Circuit of the Americas in the number seven Chevrolet Camaro of SS Greenlight Racing. Daniel Kvyat, welcome to Speed City. Thank you, John, very much. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, you're welcome. Well, the last time I saw you in person, we spent the day together, not far from here in Austin, at the NASA Space Center in Houston back in 2019. Uh, Speed City put together a guided tour of NASA that day, and, and it was not with a with a tour guide, but with an astronaut, Drew Freistool. That was one of the most fun things I've ever done, spending the day with F1 drivers, astronauts, and cosmonauts. Did you enjoy that day as much as I did? Yeah, yeah, it was a very cool day. I remember that uh, actually pretty well. Uh, yeah, we got to see uh, the whole uh, NASA uh, facilities, uh, all the training facilities where they do the zero gravity training and so on, and uh, to hang around with astronauts and with you as well was very cool. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it was very very interesting experience. Yeah, and and remember we actually stumbled into the Russian cosmonauts in the hallway, and you guys stopped and took photos together. Yeah, yeah, uh, it was a very nice experience. They later came to to visit uh, my race in uh, Austin, uh, the F one. So it was very very interesting and uh, yeah, cool experience. Well, look, you, your return to NASCAR sounds like a movie script. Uh, a Russian formula, a former F1 driver comes to Texas to race a Camaro in NASCAR. <laughs> Besides the obvious of, of racing a Chevy in NASCAR, sounds like a heck of a good time. What What is your attraction to NASCAR? I always was quite passionate about NASCAR, you know, since you're a kid, there are all these uh, movies about, uh, you know, usually Formula One and NASCAR, like Days of Thunder, for example. And uh, uh, and then the racing in itself is very interesting, I think. It's very particular and very unique. Uh, you can't really compare NASCAR to anything else. And I think, uh, in my mind, it stands somewhere up there with uh, Formula One uh, as an achievement, you know, if you win NASCAR. So uh, I always want, uh, it's not uh, easy to change, let's say, the career path because uh, my racing background is not, you know, American, it's more European because I grew up in Italy uh, pretty much for most of my life. 
And, uh, and now I, I tried NASCAR for the first time in 2022. I love the experience. Uh, and uh, yeah, I had an opportunity to come back here uh, with some of, uh, uh, of my friends uh, in the past here. They helped organize this, uh, this event. And uh, yeah, I'm going to race in Kota in Austin and uh, hopefully it will bring uh, more races in the future again. I really would like to be successful here one day. Well, it's been pretty successful here at Coda, and you know, this is, I guess, our third year and uh, I can understand an attraction from a team wanting to get you as a driver, particularly at Coda, particularly on road courses in NASCAR with all your experience at Circuit of the Americas. And I know that uh, I'm assuming that's why they were attracted to you with all your experience in, you know, in road courses and at Coda. Yes, I think so. I think uh, it's uh, it's very important uh, to for me to be racing uh, here in Cota, uh next weekend. Uh, very very great opportunity. So thanks for to SS Greenlight for that for the trust and and uh, to Chevrolet for the for the car and it's going to be a very cool experience um yeah let's see what it brings obviously i haven't done uh, a lot of races in nascar so every race for me is a new learning uh, experience uh, even if i raced in Kota already but it was a formula one car which is completely different to nascar but uh yeah i'm excited to gather more and more laps uh, hoping one day to to really put together a nice uh, competitive program in NASCAR and uh, hopefully do more and more races. Well, how did it come about this time around? Did did they reach out to you or did you make it known that you wanted to be racing in NASCAR? How did it come about this time? Uh, I we met with uh, Nathan He reached out to me uh, because we met uh, back uh, in 2022 and uh, he works very closely with uh, with SS Green Lights, and he said it would be a great idea to to make something uh, together for Austin. And I said, yeah, why not? My schedule uh, with Lamborghini in WEC uh, definitely allowed that. Uh, we checked the calendar, and uh, and we it was kind of a green uh, green light for us to go ahead with it and uh, and uh, make it happen. So we worked hard uh, for this deal to come together, and uh, hopefully we get. Uh, 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 we get it going in a very nice way uh, for the future as well and uh, I'm open to do more road courses this year and actually also ovals I, I want to start trying to get other experience on ovals as well to understand what it's like and, uh, and uh, get competitive there well it sounds like you're pretty interested in NASCAR would you consider a full-time ride in NASCAR either Xfinity or Cup yes absolutely you know I I'm ready to race anything. <laughs> Truck, Xfinity, Cup. And I'm very passionate about uh, about racing uh, here in uh, NASCAR, and uh, but also I'm uh, having very good time. But also would like to start, you know, uh, to get a shot at winning races. And uh, we of course know that the car and the team resources are important for that as well. And uh, I'm hoping to get. Uh, opportunities in the future to to start uh, fighting for wins where, where I think on road courses uh, my level will be pretty high soon and I, I can already start giving a fight to, to the top guys. Well, this weekend you're at Sebring and racing that Lamborghini in the hypercar class. That that sounds pretty cool too. Yes, I'm actually only racing WEC. I'm here to support team and do some media work for Lamborghini since I already was in the USA for my NASCAR commitment. So uh, I'm just here for that, really. Okay. And, uh, yeah, my main championship is WEC, uh, World Endurance Championship here with IMSA. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, you know, with your F1 experience, I wanted to ask you, you know, the, about some F1 questions because the F1 driver market is in full silly season already with Lewis Hamilton heading to Ferrari and the dominoes starting to fall. But, you know, there's drivers like Kevin Magnussen and Hulkenberg thought they were out of F1 and now are back and competing and competing well. Would you consider a return to F1 if your phone were to ring? 
you know, like I said to you, I, I'm uh, ready to race anywhere, track, Xfinity, Cup, also in F1. Uh, I know I would be very dusty for any F1 team, uh, but you know, F1 can be extremely political as well. And uh, some people are a little bit uh, shy uh, sometimes to talk. But uh, yeah, why not? Uh, I think I can see a few scenarios where I might fit in again. Uh, of course, many, many stars have to allow me to be back to Formula One. But uh, although I am a world champion and, uh, and if the opportunity comes, uh, definitely, definitely going to grab it. <laughs> You know, Daniel, I think many agree your F1 career is one of those that could have been even more successful and, and lasted even longer. And, and you've experienced the, the grinder that is the Red Bull driver machine. As phenomenal as the car's doing on track, at this moment, their driver situation is it's almost in chaos with Max Verstappen talking about leaving the team, Checo's seat seemingly always in danger. Your former teammate, Ricardo, is at RB now and mentioned for the Red Bull seat. What do you make of the Red Bull driver situation right now? Uh, yeah, it seems a bit chaotic there. I, I'm personally not, not very surprised. But uh, yeah, of course, uh, if uh, they seem to like to bring their old uh, friends back. So if uh, one of them wants to reach out, <laughs> they still know my phone number. I don't know if it's Helmut or I don't know if now Christian has more importance. I don't know who is, who is winning in their uh, power struggle up there. So. Uh, However, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it can get pretty interesting there. But, uh, yeah, it's an uh, interesting market as always. It's a shame that what's happening outside the track is a lot more interesting than what's actually happening on the track. Yeah, there's been a lot of that discussion this year, particularly here in the States with a lot of new fans. And, you know, they, they just maybe they were spoiled a little bit by the incredible seasons of 2021 and and, uh, you know, there's a lot of fans that don't understand that sometimes it happens in Formula One where we just get some dominant teams because they get the technology right. Um, you know, what would you tell those American fans to about Formula One in that case? Well, you just said there were some amazing uh, seasons like 2021, and then you stumbled and you couldn't name any other one. Well, I would name 2016 perhaps, but... Uh, but I think the problem is uh, there were promises that the new regulation would deliver a lot closer uh, competition between teams, but it has, I think, failed. And now again, we get one team which is clearly miles ahead of others. And uh, yeah, it makes uh, the show pretty boring, which is uh, a shame. And there is no internal team battle as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it makes it a pretty dull show at the moment, which is a shame. But... I believe from Milan, uh, they know how to react, and I think they will make adjustments. Hmm. Well, I want to get back to some NASCAR because we had a couple of uh, we reached out to our listeners and said told them we were going to get an interview with you. And one of our listeners, Kevin Kelly, wants to know if you got any advice from Jensen Button about NASCAR because obviously there's been a few others besides yourself from F1 that that decided they want to dabble in NASCAR. I don't know. I think Jensen had one race or two races I had more so I can give him an advice if he wants <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true well so what are your expectations for in this SS Greenlight Camaro for next weekend uh, I don't think we're setting ourselves extremely high expectations we just go there we try to do to get the best out of uh, myself uh, and uh, the best out of the car of course the practice is very limited it's been a couple of years since I dropped NASCAR last time. And uh, so, yeah, I think I just need to get there, see see how it's going, get up to speed, probably uh, do the race in the clean, cleanest way possible. And even though I know that the guys in NASCAR here, they race very hard. And, uh, yeah, just need to be mindful of that and uh, try to stay out of trouble like last time. <laughs> You know, I know you've raced Formula One at Coda several times. What other have you raced any other cars at Circuit of the Americas? Um, actually, no. We had some private testing uh, back in December with uh, our Lamborghini hypercar, but it was raining. So yeah, I haven't uh, done the track in much more than F1. So my F1 will be my 
reference when I get back there, but I, I need to throw it uh, away because those references will not work with the NASCAR car. <laughs> yeah. Well, and lastly, uh, I want to talk about the World Endurance Championship coming back to Circuit of the Americas in September. Uh, that's We're really excited about that. I know a lot of people are, are really excited. Are you, uh, are you looking forward to that? Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's cool that uh, obviously um, uh, WEC is maintaining uh, their relationship with uh, USA. And, uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense to come to Austin. It's a great track with a great uh, history already. And... Uh, yeah, it's going to be very cool. I'm already excited about it. Hmm. Well, Daniel Kvyat, I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, look forward to seeing you at Circuit of the Americas next weekend. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for your uh, for your interview. It was uh, a pleasure as always. All right. Well, thank you. We'll see you at Coda. See you, John. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. You know, Jonathan, he is actually a very nice guy. When we were talking about that trip to NASA at the beginning of that interview, if you recall, we had breakfast with him. We all were staying at the same hotel in Houston and uh, came down and he had he had breakfast with us. He was super brought nice. brought his guitar, if you remember. What's that? He brought his guitar that weekend. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Yeah. I hope you all enjoyed that because he was, I mean, look, you don't, it's not that often you get to talk to an F1 driver you know, like he said, he's probably not going to get that phone call. And he was pretty, pretty blunt about <laughs> the state of the sport right now. He's, you know, and of course, when you're not in the sport, they feel more inclined to criticize the sport as well. But what do you think, Granny? Yeah. And to be honest, I, I, I hope that we can do more of that because I, I really do think, you know, we get opportunities each and every weekend because, of course, Medlin to... Uh, and because of Sirius to to talk to, you know, uh, the, the current guys. Um, but sometimes we can get lost in that bubble and it's always good to get perspective. I mean, you know, the top pundits in Formula One now, Ralph Schumacher, Jack Villeneuve, Damon Hill, um, Paul DeResta, Karen Chandok. Chind so, you know, but, but Kivya is just as relevant as any of those guys. Yeah, no doubt. All right, well, let's talk MotoGP. We just have a couple minutes left because MotoGP has a new television rights deal in the United States. And Jonathan, you and I spoke earlier today and we were saying, well, is it really better than it was? And I think it is uh, because the the broadcast is going to be on True TV and on Max, right? But True TV, like I have, I don't have cable anymore, but I have YouTube TV and that's included. And, and I, I just checked my DVR and I've got the first race. And it is across a lot more platforms so there's a lot of people that already have it immediately, and there's some deals out there for it too. So I think it's a little better than it was, mainly because you can watch them live. I mean, NBC was not showing all of them live last year, and so you get every single one live, and I do think it's a little bit better deal. But but True TV, do you need a cable package of sorts to have True TV? No, you can also buy True TV uh, but you know, then that's another. It's like eight ninety nine a month or something. But so that really wouldn't be any better, except that again, it is live. Where I guess I don't think NBC was showing them in any way. Even if you paid live, you can get, of course, the MotoGP app, which is I think about one hundred and fifty bucks a year. So, you know, in that yeah, case, no, I mean to be honest, okay. I, okay, so here, here's my take on this. Um, I, I, I'm uh, the jury's out from my point of view. I, I've not heard of, tr I, you know, I come from the old school of network television. Um, and so true TV doesn't mean anything to me, although I'm sure it does mean a lot to your son and more people younger than me. But when I also read that the live stream was going to be on max and sling TV again, I was like, that that's still as far as I'm concerned in the lower field, as we like to say on the farm. That that's not right next to the house, you know. Well, that's... here's why I think you. I know exactly what you're saying, but here's why I think it's further that direction than it was because it's on multiple platforms and it's already native. Yeah. YouTube TV is big. YouTube TV is they're not as big as the old yeah. cable companies, but it is very big. It's also on Sling and some other places, so I think it's pretty big. But but we got MotoGP coming to Austin, I... and I I just wanted to cover that because it's a pretty cool story. 
I mean, MotoGP have always been very good at being pioneers in the broadcast field. And you only have to look at their current app um, and how you receive it. Um, if you do it that way, it is phenomenal. Um, you get everything you want. Um, and so that still exists. And a lot of people in the USA, especially because remember, MotoGP isn't like it is in Italy or uh, England or Australia, even um, it, it, it's still small. So, well, we shall see. All right, everybody. Well, we are done for this Sunday night show. Next weekend, Formula One is back. Check our website, speedcitybroadcast.com. We'll be doing our usual pre and post. Also, midweek, the uh, midweek show with Chris and myself. Our guest is James Hinchcliffe. So tune in. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you next weekend.